it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual intellectual community at the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. I am Adrián Pérez Melgosa, the Institute's director, and would like to extend a warm, the warmest welcome to all of you, and especially to today's special guest, Moises Vendahan, a PhD candidate in the Hispanic Studies and Literature program at Stony Brook. Uh, before introducing today's event, I would like today's to speaker, everyone. we welcome Professor Daniela Flesler. Professor Flesler is a chair of Hispanic Languages and Literature Department and is a specialist in contemporary Spanish literary and cultural studies. She is the leading academic voice in the study of how migration and memory of unresolved pasts are reshaping the contemporary Spanish cultural landscape. Besides many articles in leading journals and two splendid edited collections, Professor Flesser is the author of The Return of the Moor, the Spanish Responses to Moroccan Migration, and of the memory work of Jewish Spain, who she co-authored with, and she had a choice of co-authors from all over the world, and she chose Adrián Pérez Melgosa. Guess why? Um, it is now my distinct pleasure to pass the virtual microphone to Professor Daniela Fresler, who will introduce today's event. Welcome, Daniela, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, we are here uh, to hear mo about Moises' uh, work uh, this year. As uh, it was already said, Moises is a PhD candidate in the Department of Hispanic Languages and Literature. His dissertation in progress focuses on the representation of experiences of Asian American and Latino communities in comics produced in the US. He's especially looking at how ethnicity and race are visually constructed and negotiated in these comics. Moises has taught a wide range of courses uh, in the department and his outstanding work in the classroom was recently recognized with one of the Stony Brook's President's Awards for Excellence in Teaching by a, by a graduate student. Um, he's also uh, a recipient of the Broom and Allen Fellowship from the American Sephardic Federation. And he is the co-organizer of uh, a series of conversations that have been taking place throughout the, the semester that is called Pensando Shivan Shah, which are, I actually have a little poster uh, to show you because the, the third uh, uh, of these events is happening tomorrow. So it's a series, series of conversations uh, with members of the uh, Chinese uh, community from in Spain, and it highlights authors and, and intellectuals and artists and activists. Um, so for, you can reach to Moises for more information about tomorrow if you uh, want to attend. They have been uh, really incredible, wonderful events, uh, very well attended this semester. So Throughout this, his public humanities uh, fellowship this year, he's implementing a project called Empowering Through Visual Narratives, a workshop series aimed at middle school students, which involves reading and creating comics. So I'm sure, and we're gonna hear more about that um, right now. So uh, thank you, Moises. Thank you, Daniela, for your kind words. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Humanities, for giving me the opportunity to develop this work. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the project that I'm creating and I hope to implement very soon. I'm going to share the screen with the presentation. Uh, so as Daniela said, the project is called Empowering Empowered Through um, Reading and Visual Storytelling. And um, well, this is my name, Moisés Casamendan, and it's very nice to have a presentation so I don't have to sell myself. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, about the project uh, background, uh, um, the description of what am I currently doing, the goals of the project, and the current difficulties that I'm um, facing right now. So if I have suggestion to how to solve this, it will be great. Um, 
most of my dissertation, oh, sorry. Most of my research focused on, on the components of comics. So how I divided into very simple categories based on pictures and text. And in pictures, I focus on the pencil, the ink, and the color. And the text, I focus on the argument, the script, and the dialogue. There's a lot of more of taking place, but having these uh, separated allowed me to see how these elements um, construct an idea of ethnicity on comics. This is one of the examples that I like to point out because it's by uh, a comic made by Tom King, Joel Jones, the artist, and Jordi Belair, the colorist. And it gave me a notion of how create an Arabic, uh, an Arab wom a woman that normally has not been represented as such. And through the color and through the um, narrative, it presents a very, in, um, a, a female that is in power of the situation, not necessarily in these panels, but in the following ones. By, at the same time, it presents um, ethnicity without uh, necessarily fetishizing it. So how does ethnicity, I meet the question of how does the ethnicity comes into play? And in the text, I identify, it could be by background in the history about the development, about the language and, the, and while in pictures, it may be by the uh, physical features, the skin color or the clothes. Sometimes those elements are completely interrelated to each other, but sometimes all the elements that indicate the ethnicity are just in one of those elements and they are not interconnected to each other. So it seems that the artist and the writer don't necessarily talk sometimes, or they just gave the whole notion of how to create those ethnicities but in the color which was normally one of the most uh, accurate features, like just giving the some pictures to indicate this without having the background history. So I, will all, I always like to present the example of Khalid made by Carl Basic and Carlos Pacheco to show how the author shows the, that show some visual elements that are not necessarily in the script, like the way that they say uh, hello to each other by taking the, um, by touching he, their hearts instead of giving their hands. And this is something very subtle that Pacheco does that is not on the script necessarily. And he does it in order to evocate some notion of culture that is behind the, behind the ones that I pointed out before. On the other hand, we have a Storm or a Monroe, which is a very famous uh, X-Men, X-Woman, created by Len Wayne, the Cockrum, and, and we have here some examples here of how she was portrayed as an African woman, that then be, um, we know that she's not, um, She's African-American and then there are some slight changes, but there's not necessarily an uh, indication of the ethnicity or that is normal, uh, that is um, developed throughout the, this history. She had um, blue eyes and it's something that it's um, make her stand um, stand out uh, from other char uh, African characters. And she's portrayed as a divinity in Africa in order also to show the, um, how the authors has a very primitive image of, of the African countries. So when, the, when I was studying this, I made the question of uh, exploring the connection between the experience of Asian Americans, Latinx as perpetual migrants in comics 
To do so, I look at three main levels that are completely interconnected to each other. The first one is the depiction of this population in mainstream comics. The second one is the relationship with the narrative of what, what it means to be American. Finally, I make the question of, the, of how the memory of the homeland is portrayed throughout the diaspora. Sometimes this is very tricky because for many Chinese American, the connection throughout China is, uh, or Mexican Americans uh, throughout uh, to Mexico, is not necessary. Is more a cultural thing that they live at home rather than a memory that they have of a homeland. So I also want to question how this is portray how they portray this into comics. Comics is also, it's also something that has been used to, um, to create propaganda and racist propaganda and to use, um, to, oh, sorry, I'm going to back. <laughs> this is how to spot a Jap. Uh, US war, the, it was produced by the War Department in, in 1942. And it was a pamphlet, um, that was made for the soldiers in the Second World War that was distrib mainly distributed to show how to differentiate a Chinese person to a Japanese person in order to identify who were the good guys in front of the bad guys. So there has, ever since the creation of the comics, there always has been some um, elements of portraying ethnicity from the very beginning that was related to the, to the social, um, social economic, so, sorry, to the um, time that they were, they were living, sorry. So one of the main elements so, of my first chapter in the in this, in dissertation is to study the, um, the, per, the portrait of Jimmy Woo a character that has been very popular lately because of the, his appearance on WandaVision. And he was introduced as a Chinese American FBI agent who has a very pale skin color. And he was shown in this history as the, in the story as a Chinese link in the FBI. So this is his, the first time that he appears. And something that I notice is that this is from 1956. In uh, the, uh, some of the following panels, we show that he interacts with a Chinese lady in Chinatown, Su Wan. And we could see that the encounter of two walls because of the way that they were dressing. She was wearing a tipao while he was wearing a suit, a formal suit. But in a, for, in a later, in a later um, uh, edition of the same comic in, in the eighties, the coloring shows something very different. She kept the same co skin color while, while he became white. So he was yellow with his boss. And when he interacts with the Chinese world, he becomes white. And it's something very interesting to show the experience of Chinese American throughout um, comics. And this is something that I kept working on. So now I'm going to talk about my humanities New York project. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, I don't know if I'm going very fast, <laughs> but I hope I, I'm going to stay a little bit with some of the slides that I'm going to present now. So to start, my project didn't begin in Stony Brook, it began way earlier in, in Spain. Back in 2016, I, was, I created a, a website with a comic um, website that was called Wakum. And today I found out that the, the website is not longer online. So I'm very sad about it. 
but I basically did a survey among more than 100 authors and, and comic scholars in Spain to approach how to make the question of how the comics, the comic industry could approach a younger audience. In the later, in the last, um, well, for 20 years from the end of the, the 80s to the beginning of the to, um, 2010, the com there has been a, a lap between the comic book, the mainstream comic book industry uh, with comic as Superman, Batman, and, and Daredevil that separated themselves to, from a younger audience trying to approach uh, more mature audience while kept in a very firm base of readers that became basically collectors instead of readers. So I wanted to make the question of why kids are no longer interested in comics and how can the industry get to them. I was aiming to do uh, uh, workshops with, um, with students and uh, um, schools, but I never got the opportunity to do it. So um, one of the, among the questions that I made, I received one of the recom uh, a recommendation of the smile. Back then it wasn't, this wasn't published in Spain yet. And I did digging into, into this book because I received more than one author who recommended it. Smile is a graphic novel made by uh, author Telgemeier. Uh, it was published by Scholastic Graphic uh, in 2010. And it tells the story of a girl who have an accident and lose two of her teeth. By, in that process, she questioned who uh, the toxic relationship that he had around her and start to build up a more confident self. So I was fascinated by this. And apparently I wasn't the only one <laughs> because it became a very popular book. So in a way, um, Mel Telgemeier opened the market to new graphic novels for uh, younger audiences that were, that the many kids were waiting for without even knowing them. So it also opened the space to more female creators and people of color to enter into comic as creators. And we could see here, um, Rural Girl or Victoria Jameson, Be Prepared by Vera Brosgall or Lambert James by Donald Stevenson. However, in the New York, uh, in the la later last um, time that the, uh, New York Times made the um, most, um, the top seller um, books on, for the list. Telgemeier was four times in the top 10 with Ghost, Drama, a Smile, and Sister. And this was even before she published her later work, um, Guts, who was also a top seller. So I identify, well, she was all even five times, sorry also the babysitter uh, club was. So I, didn't, I identify, and I wasn't the only one obviously, that there was a need for this. So I proposed to create a model of six workshops of two hour uh, each, divided into three categories. The first one will be discussion. Then sharing, and finally creating. I did a selection of works that I'm going to work with. And this is three of the main books that I'm going to uh, work. So I, the Guts from Telgemeier is one of the, mo uh, the most recent ones. The Prince of the Dressmaker from uh, Jane Wang. It's a story of uh, dressmaker who made 
um, beautiful dresses for a prince who is a cross dresser. And this is very interesting because it puts a discussion cross dressing as uh, and the acceptance of the family towards it, opening the space to talk about gender in uh, non normative gender in a different way, in a way that is very approachable for kids and to understand also. The focus of this presentation today, and I think I'm going very fast, <laughs> It's uh, American Born Chinese from Jin Luen Yang because it's one of the books that made me question uh, some of the issues that lead me to the dissertation, while at the same time it was relatable for me as a Sephardic Jew in Spain. And it's very interesting because the experience is very different while I identify some of the, the question that was relatable for me. So the first part, I, um, the first part of the models were going to be a discussion. The comic will be distributed among the kids or I will give them either virtual or physically, they will have the opportunity to get them on, on to start. And they will have a guideline of the conversation that we will hold. First of all, we will have some questions before reading the book. Like, what does the title American Born Chinese mean? What do you think the story will be about? What elements do you see in the cover? What colors are more predominant in the book? All these questions could be answered by the kids by uh, on the model before they start reading them, reading it. And I show here a couple of panels where the uh, where the character Jin Wang is introduced to his new school, and the professor introduced he, uh, him to be um, straight from. Um, China instead of San Francisco where he was born. She also mispronounced her name and they allowed to some of the stereotypes of Chinese people. As we here, we see the, the kid who said, my mom says Chinese people uh, eat dogs. So in a very simple way, the author is able to create a sense of ethnicity by focusing on the only Asian in my class was Susi Nakamura. They basically, they, um, they were introduced to each other. He's Chinese and she's Japanese and they were expected to, to get along just because of that. But in, in, um, in, instead of that, they grow up to hate each other. <laughs> So once the kids are, uh, read the, the book, they will have some questions to um, keep a discussion. The first one will be describe the story in 30 words of less. Then use five to 10 keywords to describe, um, to describe the comic. I'm going to talk about comic and graphic novel in this case interchangeably because that's the way that I usually do. And then how does the story of the Monkey King connect to Jin Wang's? Well, um, I forgot to, to, to um, speak about the story of the book. <laughs> American Born Chinese is the story of Jin Wang, um, a Chinese American kid who questioned his own identity and struggles with it by refusing the Chineseness on, him, on himself. And the same time we read the story of, of the Monkey King, uh, it's the, the, um, a retelling of the story of, of the journey to the West, a very ancient uh, Chinese uh, tale. And the story of the Monkey King who aims to become a God 
um, to be, but mostly to be acknowledged as such. So there's many ways that both the stories connect to each other. And lastly, there's the story of Danny, an American kid who has a Chinese relative who come to visit to town. And every time that the, the this um, relative comes, he feels very awkward. I'm going to show why. So, uh, well, we have, we kept a discussion on after with some questions that the kids will have to guide the, the reading. And I'm going to, there's many play times on the story where transformation is very important. In the case of the Monkey King, he tries to become human to, by being taller and he got trapped into a mountain just by refusing to go back to his true form. When he got back to his true form, he became, um, he became free. In this case, Dean Wan tries to become more American by emulate some of the hair dress that he saw on, on his school. And he tries to become more American also by becoming white. And by trying to be that, he finally became that. So there's a moral of the story uh, that we see very subtle, that is um, to be aware, it becomes a cautionary tale of be, be aware of what you want to, uh, what you wish for. So the relative that comes to visit is a very stereotypical Chinese that has um, very pronunciate uh, physical features and speaking a very stereotypical um, in a very broken English. So I would like to, this is something controversial because um, it exposed to kids to some sort of racism that they are able to identify, but in a funny way. So I expect to, by facing this, I expect to get some reaction to to the students. So I will ask them, what reaction did you get by show, seeing this character? And why? what do you think the author was expecting to provoke? Finally, I will ask, what does the applause on the left, the left that we see on the bottom means? So this will finish like the first part of the model, which will focus on on reading and discussing. So the kids will all already read the, the, the book when they come to the, to the workshop, but here they will have the opportunity to discuss about it and to take to come with some notes, sorry. And by sharing those notes, we will be able also to identify the visual elements that we see on, screen, on the panels. Something that we see here is that the luggage has the form of the takeouts of Chinese food in the US. And we also saw the elements of the, the, the love and the applause on the bottom that recreates the effect of the sitcom. Um, here we see the, the transformation very visually. And we also see the transformation here with um, the decrease of the intensity of the color. So I will give a, a very basic tutorial on graphic narrative to the, to the students in order to be able to identify those elements by, and later to replicate them. The second part of the, of the model is a little more complex and it's related to sharing. The aim is to create a safe space for students to speak and to be listened to. By doing that, we so uh, to do that, we are going to talk about the relativity of the of the book, and then I will show I will share my personal experience. So with that, I'm going to with this 
the relativity I'm going to address on how the student feel about the comic and how, do, how I do feel about it. Then I will talk about some experience related to in this model, for example, about the ethnicity and how I felt, um, how I felt um, discriminated on or my, or with, uh, micro discriminated in Spain in order to open the discussion for them to see that uh, talking is natural and talking is something that they could do in that space. Then I, I'm going to open the space to, uh, with some questions to, for the students to share a personal story that could be related to the comic that they read. Or maybe something trivial that um, focusing on an event uh, of, of friendship or acceptance in the school. So the last part is going to be the main goal of the of the of the workshop is creating the comic itself. First, we will have analyzed the visual elements uh, from the discussion and they will have taken notes of it. Then they are going to take one of the personal story of the sharing and finally they will make, make it into a graphic story. How I'm going to, um, to make um, this happen? In collaboration with um, different authors, one of them is Don Wing, an assistant professor and a reference instruction librarian. And Don Wing has cre uh, created different workshops to making comics in, uh, with use in libraries. So she had experience on how to approach um, these kids. But with her, I'm going, she's going to develop a tutorial video explaining her creating process and also how to face, she's going to give tips on how to face a blank page. This, um, she, her books, her work also as um, creator itself shows how, um, how to tell the experience of a Chinese American in the US. The interesting part of her work is that the focus on, on the, it will show that creating comics doesn't have to, um, it could be multimedia and she used collage and different process to, to draw and to create. I put here an example of her drawing, but she had a lot of work online that is uh, free to see. And given the, um, showing the Don's work, it's going to be very accessible for the kids to relate to, and also to see some other um, process, another um, drawing an art different from the ones that we are that we see on the on the graphic novels and they are is going to be less intimidating by for them i'm going to give to provide them with layouts of of different um comic book um panels and i will go also going to analyze these on how to tell the story for example, in this case, we could see that the, a bigger space will give them the opportunity to focus on the action on that, um, on that um, panel. While in here, for example, it will be more structured one with uh, six panels that gives a, that is going to give them more space to create a story more paced while here is broken the panel, the, the layout in order to show some chaos. So the idea of the, of the workshop is to provide them with how I look at the comics in my research uh, by analyzing the, the visual elements and put it into play by doing it naturally into the creation in a very guided process. So the current struggles that I am facing is first of all, the accessibility to virtual platforms and resources. I want to 
uh, my goal in these um, workshops was mostly to address some, um, to work with public schools, to work with private schools. And some of the kids could have resources to, to access, to enter online and to uh, work. Some of them can, don't. And without a good connection to the internet, this will be very hard to make. The second one in person drawing, my, it's also important that I was looking to create um, a space for them to draw in a very freely way. It will be guided, but at the same time, I won't give them a bit. I'm, my goal is for them to put the story into draw, into art very soon without necessarily um, have um, drawing lessons. So I'm not going to look for perfection in the art style and very proportional um, art, but I wanted to them to draw, like from the very beginning. Doing it online is a little more complicated, mostly because I will not be able to see what they are draw doing in case that they, they have some virtual platform to draw, that will not be necessarily the case for all students and this became a, a struggle to do that. Finally, well, so, uh, thirdly, sorry, uh, will be the reception of the comics. Once they have created the comic in a paper, they will have to scan it and that will, that will be the same issue with accessibility to how to share this production. But lastly, and I think more importantly, is the virtual fatigue that the student uh, have, especially in an extracurriculum activity, uh, uh, proposing a virtual event that is not necessarily in the, in the um, curriculum of a school, means like more time for them to be online and therefore more fatigue. So I'm trying to, re I'm reaching out museums as the Museum of Tennis American and the Museo del Barrio in order to approach, to present this project and to see different ways to do it um, in, a, in a small group of students that are, that we are able to do that by facilitating also most of the drawing materials that they will need. And this is roughly my project and the phase that I'm now. I don't know if you have any questions. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Mrs. I I we can open the floor to questions and uh, if you have questions, you can either bring them up to the chat or raise your hand and uh, either, I guess, Daniela or me will, um, yes, give you voice. Okay. I think Lou has a question. I see a hand. Is that a question, Lou? I think you have to. Unmute yourself. I think he has to be unmuted. He has to be unmuted by us, by host. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, Moises, very interesting. I was just wondering whether you were going to be planning this workshop in English or Spanish and what um, problems you will have either way. Um, the Thank you, Lou. Um, that's a very good question because one of the things that I was aiming for is that to make the workshop very um, easy to replicate because they want the cost for an institution to make it, it will be basically the paper. And for the, for the students or the people um, joining, it will only be the, the books itself that are roughly 10 or $20 each. So it will be very easy um, to, to do. 
most of the books that I'm working on has versions in Spanish and in, in English. And I wanted to approach the Museum of Chinese American to do it in English, but I also wanted to have a, a, a version in Spanish to approach another kind of audiences. But um, my goal was doing sep um, to, to replicate it into different languages and different institutions. Interesting. Thank you. Katie? Katie has, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Moises. Always fascinating. And I always am, I mean, I, I've learned so much about comics from you and Javier. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to both of you um, for, this, for this education. And, you know, as you know, I even taught, uh, ta I taught some comics in a class and brought you in to speak to the students. So it's, it's really, it's been exciting. Um, my question goes back actually to um, the slide you had about the, your, the website that you set up in, in Spain before you came here, right? Um, and this kind of crisis in readership that you saw. And I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, I'm curious about whether you actually see the same phenomenon in the US, but my, my question, and this is just, you know, my casual impression, I mean, the last time I was in Madrid um, before the pandemic, I was there during the season of the book fair in the Retiro. And I would, it seemed to me like such a sizable percentage of the stands were uh, devoted to comics. And, you know, there were families and kids. And, you know, I mean, to me, that was a sign of a very healthy um, publishing industry and also readership for comics. Um, so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that. Uh, thank you, Katie. That's um, that, that's one of the things that I'm trying also to navigate with, because the crisis in reading that I mentioned was mostly five years ago, and mostly for kids. In the in the last five years, things have changed completely in those in that sense. Why? Um, mostly because of how Raina and other authors open the space and open the market with um, targeting different audiences. He basically, the I identified two different levels of crisis. In one sense, the, um, the mainstream comic books of uh, superheroes became more and more evident that they were looking for creating brands rather than creating um, comics. And the, they created some materials for kids to read, but they, that wasn't the main um, direction. Like instead of having a Spider-Man available for kids, they creating a Spider-Man available for kids. I'm very, um, a very, um, how do you say this? Lab um, very punctual label of the publisher that was aiming for kids with the same kind of authors. So there wasn't a change in the, in that sense, the basically they treated kids as um, down by those, instead of treating them as kids. Uh, so on the other hand, in Spain particularly, the industry was trying to separate themselves from kids by saying, if we create uh, comics for more mature audiences, um, as the case of El Arte Volar or some graphic novels of Paco Roca, who has, was, I mean, like, they were looking to make the distinction between high and low art rather than being, than creating comics to be read. 
So I identified those crises in the five in the last five years in um, these um, market that were open in Spain, in the U.S. Um, that were being open in Spain in the last ten years I started to get to Spain, it's slow, very slowly, and now they are not as common uh, as in the U.S. But the market is, is being opening up, uh, but mostly with um, American production rather than European one. Not only with um, with uh, Spanish one, but at the same time, co uh, classic comics, uh, Asterix, where um, Mortadelo, where um, for kids that um, there has always been in the market, but they were exceptions also. But but isn't it just? I mean, it's sort of paradoxical though, because I mean, I think comics seem to originate and were perceived as unserious and for children, mm -hmm. right? Precisely. And I mean, what we've seen, you know, say post mouse is uh, a recognition that this is a medium, right? That is, you know, as intellectually and artistically complex as, you know, more mainstream forms of narrative or visual art, right? Yes, yes. Uh, at the same time, Mouse is a very good example on how um, he showed that comics could be also a form of high art. But what I was trying to look at also is how the mainstream industry, and this happened mostly after Watchmen and uh, Frank Miller work said, okay, so we could sell comics, superhero comics to, to adults. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to look for grim and greedy comics um, to be sold and, to, and they become um, high value collectible art, uh, art article for many, for many adults that became also very hard to kids to get into because of the complexity of some storylines that were very dark and the price were up, the industry became very toxic for, um, for non cisgender kids. So there's many things that came into play in, mainstream, in, the, main, in the mainstream industry of superheroes. And for non-superhero, uh, books, it was very, very hard for creators to get into it and to get distributed. Um, I have a question. So Moises, in terms of the implementation of this project, like in schools or, or in the museums that you talked about, I mean, was it that that I'm guessing from your presentation that you weren't really able to do it this year because of the pandemic and the fact that most kids were online in school and so the plan is that to do it next year or what is your idea? Um, Timing and implementation and... Yeah, so in terms of implementation, I was um, looking to, I'm developing a very uh, strong um, proposal to send to, uh, to start to the Museum of Tennis American and to the Museum of El Barrio. I have been looking what they have, their projects, um, but they haven't been, the Museum of Tennis American, at least they haven't opened it up yet. And I see that the possibility of doing it online is in a way feasible, but I will lost a lot of um, audiences of public that I wanted to reach. And that's something that I'm still navigating with on how to do it. I think doing it in person will be more productive and it will also be more easy for, for the for the participants.
Well, thank you, Moises. I also have a question about, well, I have many questions. I want to thank you first for, uh, I mean, as, as you do this division between, on the one side, more the technical drawing, and then on the other side, the more um, narrative uh, things. I wonder to what degree, what, what we would call in cinema, the mise-en-scene, the, the actual objects that surround and, and the way they are positioned in space, all these characters also conveys uh, a certain degree of ethnicity. And together with that, I was thinking about, uh, you know, a group that is very interesting, which is the group that actually is the, uh, the you know, overlaps both, which is the, you know, the Latino Asian community, which exists and also has, uh, you know, many representatives uh, that have migrated from Latin America into the U.S. and also from, you know, mixed uh, couples in the U.S. So I wonder uh, if you have those uh, people in mind and as an audience and how would you change uh, or how would you address uh, that group that actually participates on both the Chinese or the Asian American, not the Chinese, the Asian American, on the Latino experience where they overlap. So Miss and Sen and the mixed group. <laughs> so I don't think um, it will be, I, I, the project that I'm creating, I put the example of the, um, of the Chinese American for one um, very clear reason, which is that the production of, of Asian Americans in comics, uh, especially in the comics that I'm studying, has been very, um, has been published very quickly and in a space that is very easy for the kids to relate with. In the case of the uh, Latinos, the Latinx, it normally goes in a different way. Why? Because um, some of the, uh, the main, the two main, um, publishers that distribute the um, the graphic novels for these audiences is uh, Scholastic, uh, Scholastic Graphic, and first uh, second, which is uh, it's a label from McGraw Hill. There's many uh, Asian American authors within both of the both of the um, publishers. There's not that many uh, Latinx. Most of the Latinx uh, production in comic take place in a more underground, uh, in more underground labels that doesn't speak necessarily to these younger audiences. So this is why I focus for the presentation on, on American born Chinese, which is a very clear example of what I wanted to, to look for. At the same time, uh, how will I approach um, la, um, an Asian Latino? I don't think it will change on the approach of the, of, of the workshop because not, not the whole workshop is um, looks for talk about ethnicity. For example, in the case of um, sorry, in the case of um, the Prince of the Dressmaker uh, is a Asian American creator, but it talks about cross dressing and it doesn't deals with ethnicity. In the case of Gats, um, it talks about mental health mostly, and toxic relationships also. So it's not necessarily relatable, uh, for, it's not necessarily connected to ethnicity or race. I put the example of American born Chinese because it's the one that is more connected to my research, but not all of them will be. I, I don't know if I, I answered your question. Uh, Yes, I misunderstood because of the example that that was the, the main focus of the. Yeah, but thank you. I think I spoke too fast on the, on the presentation and I there's so, always some stuff that I give for granted. Um, 
for example, something that I wanted to explain is that um, in the class, especially in the class of um, that I gave with uh, Katie, I spoke about the connection between colors and feelings and how they are presented on the comics. So that's why I ask, uh, what's the predominant color on American born Chinese? Um, because there's a whole theory of that is very deep into Western society of what colors means. And the, the, means of, the meaning of yellow in the Western society and the one in the Eastern society is not necessarily the same. And that's something that I'm going to go into deep into it um, in a way that the students will be able to understand. At the same time, um, something that the, the selection of these three books, for example, of American born Chinese on guts and the, um, or um, American born Chinese guts and um, the Prince and the Dressmaker, all of them has a very visual component uh, that not that are not necessarily in all, all of the comics for, for these audiences. And they all present um, strong colors with simple, with drawings that seem simple, but are super detailed. And I'm going to guide the conversation into see those elements on, and how these visual elements contribute to the story. In the case of American born Chinese, as I said, there's a very uh, importance of the yellow color that oh, um, we see from um, even from the cover, and we see constantly on the on the comic itself. It seems that there's even like a yellow filter on, on it, and it gives the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, in the case of the of the prince and the dressmaker. There's a very, the way that she portrays the dresses that the prince wears, um, they are very, very beautifully drawn. So it also creates a conversation about what's the meaning of giving so much importance to, to the texture of um, the textile of these um, drawings of these dresses. And yeah, it, I will also talk, uh, The Prince and the Dressmaker is set on Austria in the 18th century, I think. So I will also uh, talk about how this age, um, this time is presented on the, on the graphic novel. And that way, the idea of talking about it is not to, to analyze it in a, in a scholarly way, but to be able to provide the student to some visual elements to think about when they are creating. Lou? Go, go ahead, Lou. Oh, you are muted. Um, that one image of a um, Chinese man that was a humorous image where he sang a raw America, something like that. Recently, a, a comedian here in America got in big trouble for making fun of Chinese accents. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if when you're looking at these materials, if you need to be extra careful not to introduce something that students might find funny enough to imitate and um, reproduce something you don't want to reproduce. I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, Moises. No, um, completely, Lou. Um, that's a good question, but I think the comic it itself answered that question. So the, um, this character is um, a stereotypical figure that is humoristic in a way but it's not been shown to create um, to create um, how do you say um, comedy, but to create uh, awkwardness among the main character on how he reacts to it. So the way that it 
the, the story is developed, uh, he uh, shows his, the, this character shows his true self and he shows that he's the monkey king trying to teach a lesson. So um, it is true that some of these example could be easily, um, easily uh, misinterpreted. But I think in, um, in this case in particular, it's very clear that the comic has this um, answer itself to it. And the other, the other select, the rest of the comics that I selected um, doesn't have portraits like this. As you were speaking, I was remembering this uh, famous graphic novel. One of the first ones I ever read, I think it was The Protocols of the Elders of Zion by Eisner. Yes. Yeah. Very famous graphic novel. And, and it's obviously meant to teach people about what was wrong with the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Yeah. And it, he's very angry actually in that book. He's like, I think yeah. he's his last um, work and it has a very pedagogical um, aspect, but at the same time, he shows a very angry position um, that we see in his last two works, the Fagin and the Jew, uh, which, is, which shows like the story of Fagin from uh, Oliver Twist, um, mm. the protocols they both has this intention to 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 be um teachable experience for the, mm. for the reader yeah. it's a wonderful project thank you thank you well we have time for more questions if uh anybody in the audience wants to step forward and share their uh, question I think I was clear. Okay. Then I'm going to take the opportunity to do a shout out to the tomorrow's event of Pensando Sibania which I'm doing with uh, Mary Kate Donovan, an alumni from the department. Um, we are going to talk about activism and education in Chinese diaspora. Um, we are going to count with Antonio Lu Yang, uh, a lawyer, uh, Ines Herrero, who is an, act, uh, an online activist, and uh, UFU, uh, uh, intercultural mediator. It's going to be a conversation about activism and education and is going to show three different of uh, ag activism within the um, Chinese community in Spain in a social way in uh, in the streets for things like that and in social media public sphere pu uh, private sphere and social media <laughs> Great, uh, Moises, and these have been really innovative events and you had enormous uh, uh, repercussion with it. La the audiences have been very, very large for these events and I want to congratulate you on that. And of course, to congratulate you, to, uh, to congratulate you on today's talk, it was really a great uh, opportunity to listen to your work and to see how you are thinking and progressing in your thinking and uh, just keep going with the project. And of course, uh, I know that um, Adam Capitano from Humanities New York is here with us today. And I know that their resources uh, for educating us about how to progress uh, or, or, or put our, our projects out there in, in the public sphere uh, are part of the fellowship that you get. And, and I know that 
you know, that education will, will become handy in solving some of the problems that, problems that you have expressed here today. Of course, the pandemic has made it very special for all of us, but there is also opportunities in there to, to explore. And I hope that you bring the project forward and, and actually you know, see what the praxis uh, makes, it, uh, makes of it and how it changes. Thank you everyone for attending today's event. And it's been wonderful to have you all here. And I look forward to seeing you in future virtual talks at the Humanities Institute. Thank you.